I assume most of you are here because you realize that information security is important. Um, but I just wanted to go through a number of cases where stuff that seems like it really isn't that valuable either to you or to other people actually is for different reasons. So, um, you know, companies have assets. Uh, some stuff's pretty boring, land, equipment, uh, sometimes, um, I, I don't know, there are a bunch of things. But you have people and you have data. And I'm going to focus mostly on data today. Data is really interesting because, one, it's one of the few things that somebody can steal that affects a lot of people other than you. If somebody steals your tractor, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't destroy other people's lives. But if somebody steals your customer data, that can hurt a lot of people. Um, and the other cool thing about data is that sometimes you don't even know that it's been taken. Um, so anyway, there's some obvious stuff. Credit card data, banking data. If that's stolen, it lets some, the person who steals it profit directly at the expense of the people from whom it's stolen. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of people realize that's valuable. Even if you don't use it yourself, if you steal a bunch of this stuff, you can sell it for about a dollar to five dollars per record on the black market. Um, more valuable thing that a lot of people overlook is medical data. So, you know, if you get a credit card statement every month, you're going to look over it. Did I buy that? Did I buy that? With medical stuff, though, normally it's somebody else paying for it. Government health insurance, low deductible health insurance. So, um, it's not rare, not rare that like a $10,000 hip replacement will just go unnoticed. Um, and so this, these records are worth a lot more than credit card data, sometimes as much as $50 per record if it's you know, stolen data. Um, so then also, if you have an e-commerce site, a lot of times you don't handle the payments yourself. So you're not taking customer credit card data, you don't think there's a big risk. But that doesn't mean that somebody who steals your data can't steal people's credit card data. So if somebody hacks into somebody's account on your e-commerce site and just has his contact information and purchase history, he can call that person and say, hey, you know, regarding that recent purchase, it didn't go through, I need your credit card data. And it can also be used you know, to build larger confidence schemes, things like that. Um, and when it finally comes out that the fraud was based on information stolen from you, it hurts your reputation. There'll be more on that later. Um, so the other thing that a lot of businesses have that they don't realize is valuable is people's passwords. Now, your site may have nothing valuable on it whatsoever. You may just have you know, people's photos they're public, posting publicly. But those passwords are valuable to people, not necessarily to hack into your site, but to hack into other sites. So uh, this year, there was a big hack on a free web hosting site. Um, stole all the passwords, passwords, which were stored in plain text. Um, shortly afterwards, there were a bunch of hacks on Vodafone and British Gas. Turned out, it was the stolen account data from here. Um, and this happens all the time. So Sony and Yahoo got hacked a while back. And so some researcher wanted to see how many you know, shared username password combinations there were among the people who had accounts on both sites. The um, number was 59%. So a lot of times, you may just have a site that's completely worthless, but somebody will hack into it just to steal the passwords to use somewhere else. And a lot of times, you'll be held liable for that, you know, depending on your jurisdiction and how negligent you were. Um, so, uh, so there are a lot of hacks that are focused on stealing data to use for particular self-benefiting purposes. But a lot of times, Hacks are just done to cause harm for different reasons. Sometimes somebody doesn't like you, doesn't like one of your customers, or just gets kicks from causing harm. And Anonymous is certainly one of those organizations that has its moral justification sometimes, but it's pretty clear a lot of times it's just trying to cause trouble. Um, so a few years ago, oh, that brings me to the next really cool one, though, aside from causing trouble. So a few years ago, Anonymous hacked into the Scientology you know, servers and <laughs> It stole all sorts of stuff, including secret videos of Tom Cruise talking about advanced Scientology concepts that you have to pay, you know, normally a few hundred thousand dollars to learn about. Um, so the organization was really upset about it, um, tried to file lawsuits, didn't go very far. So sometime after that, there were a bunch of hacks on the Epilepsy Foundation uh, online forums. And these mostly uh, consisted of embedded images and links to images that triggered seizures. And so obviously, somebody's very heartless. So originally, it looked like Anonymous was responsible for this and you know, was widely decried for attacking epileptics. But further investigation showed that it was probably a false flag operation, probably carried out by the Church of Scientology. So uh, the, the point here is that a lot of times, um, or not a lot of times, but it's not uncommon to attack one target in order to hurt somebody else, whether it's you know, to blame somebody else for the attack or to get to somebody through, you know, stealing data to use on another site. Um, 
so let's see what I can talk about next. Okay, so why are these people? Why do people try to hurt other people when there's not self, you know, profit motivation? Sometimes it's a competitor, a competitive advantage, but a lot of times, you know, bitterness, former customer, former employee. Um, sometimes there's a challenge to it, and I have to, you know, say when I'm trying to look at people's systems, I get really excited when I find a big hole, and um, it, it's, you know, in countries that have low employment rates and large numbers of educated people there aren't a lot of better hobbies than trying to break into people's systems. Um, and when you do it, you get a lot of attention. You know, you say to all of your other, you know, scattered 13-year-old unemployed friends around the world, look, I hacked into somebody's site, and it's a big deal. Um, and then, you know, it's also fun. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's why people do it. And, you know, so there are, two, there are two sides of an attack. One, somebody's doing it because he gets something out of it. But it's also an attack and not just, you know, access because it hurts you and it has costs. So a lot of times it's direct financial loss to you, to your customers, for which you're then liable oftentimes. Um, sometimes you lose data. So somebody will re, you know, wipe out your database and suddenly you don't know to whom you owe money, who owes you money, stuff like that. And that has huge costs and it can take years to piece back together. Um, and then the other thing, no matter how big or small the hack is, is reputation. Somebody may just hack your website and put an image that says the site's been hacked, steal no data, tamper with no data, but it's gonna take years for your reputation to recover. And I think Target's still working with that these days. Um, so I'm gonna go and skim through this stuff briefly, because um, I, I do a lot of work with web applications. Um, so a lot, of sites, you know, a lot of sites for companies are internally developed, and as a result of this, they miss things. And there are a lot of obvious things for people who are really serious about this that people who you know, do in-house development miss. And particularly in Hong Kong, um, if, if you look at 10 sites for businesses in Hong Kong, seven of them will have something other than a static website. And in my experience, six of those seven will have some major security problem. Sometimes it's weak or missing encryption. Sometimes it's inconsistent encryption where most of the traffic is secured, but you can still steal the session cookie and then masquerade as the user and steal the data. Um, request forgery is a big one. This allows, uh, an attacker who gets you to visit a page to act on your behalf on a site that you're logged into if it's not properly set up to protect against that. So you can change people's profile information, um, execute purchases on their behalf, uh, redeem airline miles, things like that. Um, sometimes people include resources from third parties like images that they don't necessarily you know, trust or whatever. So somebody who hacks into somebody else's site can change an image that's embedded in your site, which hurts sometimes. Uh, code injection lets somebody execute stuff either on your server or on the customer's computer when he's visiting your site. Uh, missing access controls too. So sometimes a uh, web application will assume that just because you have a URL, you're authorized to execute the, ac the action that going to it would trigger. That's often a really bad assumption and makes for a lot of good attacks. So um, there are back-end risks. A lot of these are sort of the same thing. Um, a lot of times uh, people you know, we'll set up, a, set up a server and never update it. And eventually, as time goes on, known vulnerabilities show up, and they're published often by the, comp, you know, by the people who provide the software. But the hackers read those things, look for old versions of it that have the problem, and manipulate that. Um, passwords and physical access are obvious. Uh, so on the web application side, if you do have a web application, there's this free guide called the OWASP Top 10 that has lists of common vulnerabilities in web applications and middleware. Um, and if you're developing a web application, you have to go through that checklist and make sure that you've hit all those points. Um, so I've talked mostly about technical risks, and that's mostly what I deal with. But you can have all that stuff perfectly lined up, and your people can still mess something up and cost you big time. Um, and so if you have a large organization, you have a lot of people working for you who aren't friends and family members, don't necessarily care deeply about you, just want to get home at five, um, and aren't necessarily technical experts. So if you have a big company and a lot of employees, at some point you're going to have some sort of data breach. It's going to happen. So there are technical things you can do, though, to limit the size of those breaches um, when you're designing software. So you want it to happen as seldom as possible. Make it as difficult as possible to steal credentials, do things like that. You also want to make sure it's as small as possible. So, you know, if you have an employee who only needs to access one record every few minutes on the phone with the customer, there's no reason that customer's account needs to be able to scrape all of your data in under a minute. Because if that happens, it's probably somebody taking control of the machine and scraping the data. So throttling access and detecting overages 
are very important for limiting the scopes of these breaches. Um, and then once you've detected it, you want to know how big it is, how much data has been affected, uh, whether it's been stolen or modified. Um, and you want to be able to recover the data. So you want to know what this record said two or three days ago to be able to go back to that if you know it's been affected. And these are things that you have to build in to your, you know, your application software. Backups can't do this because the backup is always too old to use. If, if it's a few days old, you lose two or three days of business. So these are design considerations. Um, and once you found out, you know, somebody's account data has been taken, you have to act on it and let them know. Um, so these are human factor things. Uh, password policy, I see a lot of organizations that uh, have really bad password policy where they make people change them too often, make them too long. If you do that, people are gonna write them on sticky notes and it defeats the whole purpose of having good passwords. Um, and so you also need to figure out who needs to have access to what information and how much of it. So somebody may need to be able to view the customer, you know, uh, view customer contact information, but probably doesn't need to see customer credit card information and probably doesn't need to be able to scrape all the customer, you know, contact information in under a minute. Um, so I talked about this before detecting misuse. Um, and with credit card information, everybody wants to steal it. And a lot of times, you either want it encrypted in your database or you want it in a separate database that your employees don't generally have access to. Um, it's amazing how often you know, somebody will hack into a web application and be able to steal every credit card that's ever been used on the site. Um, so, skim through this. There was something I want, oh, so I'm gonna get to human factors. So there are a lot of things you can do on the technical side, but, and this isn't my area of expertise, but I think a lot of companies miss a lot of opportunities um, to get you know, big value from lowering these human factor risks. So you wanna hire people you trust. Um, and you, know, you, look for, you can look for a lot of things. Hiring friends of friends is something that my family's business does a lot of. Um, you wanna encourage accountability, but also disclosure. So you don't want somebody who's aware of a breach to keep it quiet for fear of discrediting yourself. You want to know about these things. Um, and so it's important to have policies that you know, uh, incentivize that. Um, and you want to train people on the risk from data loss and teach them how to avoid it. So what it all comes down to, though, uh, in terms of assessing risks and addressing them is not knowing stuff. So you want to know your systems. You want to know what software they're running, um, how the software is configured. And you want to know how things connect, how one server knows that it's actually talking to the other server, um, whether that data is secure in transit. Um, and you want to be able to verify identities. That's very important. Uh, for preventing one attack from cascading into more attacks. And you want to know your people, as I was talking about. Um, and once you have all this knowledge, you can build a complete picture of your organization's systems and how they interact and how people interact with them. And if you have a medium-sized organization or larger, this is something you have to do, because a lot of times you'll find something in here that you didn't know about that's actually a huge threat. And so I always encourage people, have somebody map out your systems, figure out you know, all the dark corners, all the dark doorways, how they connect. Um, and if you, you know, if, if you identify all these risks, you can keep down the risks of a technical breach, of a human breach, and you can keep down the size of whatever breach actually happens when it happens. Um, and I guess I talked really fast, so I'm done. <laughs> it was a pleasure. <laughs>